today's format will be a 45-minute PowerPoint presentation followed by a short Q&A from the audience. Tom Lant is Policy Director for the Healthy Building Network, a national nonprofit committed to transformation of the market for building materials to advance the best environmental, health, and social practices. Tom has over 30 years of experience with energy and environmental issues, primarily focused on the health and environmental impacts of buildings, materials, and energy. He helped coordinate the development of green guidelines for healthcare and lead for healthcare. He currently oversees the development of rating criteria for the Healthy Building Networks FAROS project, an online tool for assessing the health and environmental impact of building materials, and coordinates the development of the new health product declaration. This session continues our discussion on how to make informed decisions about health and environmental impacts as we specify building products. Last month's webinar, presented by Lisa Gooden Robbins, talked about EPDs, or environmental product declarations. Today, Tom will discuss the new kid on the block, HPDs, or health product declarations, which addresses not just what's in the product, but also what makes, what that means for human health. At this time, Tom will take the mic. Great, thanks a lot. Yes, today I'm gonna to talk about something near and dear to all CSI members, submittal forms. Um, or really ways for communicating information about product content and chemical hazards in, in building products and dealing with the emerging, emerging science on that in the most responsible and responsive way. Now, for a long time, architects and contractors were content with labels, the, the labels that existed out there. Architects assumed and lead reinforced that using lower no VOC paint and flooring and other f interior finished products that have been tested and certified um, for the levels of their VOC or volatile organic content emissions. So one of these programs pretty much covered healthiness and indeed we made a lot of progress in improving products through the, uh, the programs um, that these labels represent. Um, basically, we, you know, we did that recognizing that the volatile organic compounds are emitted from a wide variety of materials and can cause everything from asthma to cancer. Um, and working on the theory that ventilation systems reduce but don't eliminate um, the levels of those of those VOCs, they keep keep coming back. We we put samples of um, those products into test chambers measure the emissions coming off them in micrograms per hour, put that into a little black box model where we take the amount of product in a typical building, the volume of the building, and the rate of ventilation that's diluting that, and come out with a predicted concentration, usually in micrograms per meter cubed or parts per million, um, for how much of each of those uh, volatile organic compounds that are measured in the, uh, in the test chamber are actually gonna be in the final building. And then we compare that predicted concentration to threshold levels of concern. Um, the most common uh, scheme for this is comparing against the California sea rails, these chronic reference exposure levels that the state of California is determined by uh, assessment of, the, um, of a broad range of science um, looking at where the lowest, uh, the lowest levels or the highest levels where there's no um, no adverse effects from these um, from these chemicals. This is uh, what is known often as the 1350 um, protocol. Uh, more technically correct now, the California um, and and requires the uh, the uh, predicted concentration to be less than half of the California sea wells in these. Um, are the kind of programs that you see and uh, recognized in the program now. So all of this is, is great. Let's like say we've, we've improved products considerably through these programs, identifying volatile organic compounds that were off-gassing out of carpets and ceiling tiles and all, and, and manufacturers have done a lot of work to reformulate um, to avoid emitting hazardous levels of those compounds as a result. But we find that in, you know, in, in recent years, particularly, there have been a, a whole series of chemicals of concern raised by EPA and others that, um, that don't fall under these programs. Phthalates, uh, flame retardants, the perforonate chemicals, fluorinated paraffins, bisphenol A are all ones that have been targeted in recent years by EPA 
um, for elimination because of their concern of these things finding falling uh, showing up in in people's blood streams and levels of concern. And unfortunately, we use a lot of these in building materials um, on a wide range of of products. Um, not only is EPA raising concerns about them, but a number of uh, of state, uh, federal, and and international governments like the European Union with their reach are actually moving to um, to sunset use of some of these chemicals. So how can we avoid getting caught in these um, in in our buildings? Well, these are in our buildings. As we start looking at dust studies, we're um, finding things all over the place. And unfortunately, <clears throat> um, many of them um, any of these new chemical concerns are not VOCs. They're not volatile organic compounds. They may be semi-volatile organic compounds or not volatile at all, meaning they don't necessarily leave the, the product by, uh, by the traditional off-gassing, by the phenomenon that creates that new carpet and new paint smell. Um, but maybe by other, other modes, um, and then these semi-volatiles will latch onto a piece of dust or become a piece of dust themselves, be abraded off of a product or otherwise um, flake off of it as it deteriorates and, um, and find a pathway to human exposure through other means than, than gassing. So that means that these programs that are dependent on measuring volatile organic compounds are not yet assessing these programs. And again, and though there's discussion about how to do that, it's it's a lot trickier. The, the, the lab protocols um, are, are more challenging for the semi-volatiles, uh, and there aren't established thresholds for, uh, uh, for dust measurements and that. We don't have good, good ways of just plugging these chemicals directly into the emissions programs yet. Um, but we can't really wait for that, so we're not uh, as we have more hazards evolving here that we don't want to be responsible for and don't want to be bringing to our buildings. So a lot of firms have been looking at MSDSs, trying to determine whether some of these chemicals of concern are on them. Of course, that's kind of difficult. Anyone who's spent much time with MSDSs knows that often a lot of materials are proprietary, and the information that is there is often very arcane um, with cast numbers and long chemical numbers. So what do you do about that? Well, a number of um, programs have been uh, developing different red lists, um, which is getting increasingly challenging for the firm and for the manufacturer alike, as these red lists are overlapping. Um, Lead Health for Healthcare has added a bunch of new ones that are uh, in the Chemicals of Concern credit. Uh, that's up for comment now. Cl comment closes today. Um, the Living Building Challenge has a different different take. EPA's list of concerns overlaps, but doesn't include all of these. Perkins and Wills um, precautionary list uh, offers different different levels of con uh, different chemicals of concern. Um, the Living Building Challenge has a watch list beyond the red list of ones you must avoid. Um, it gets uh, and, and we've developed red lists even beyond any of the ones that are included in these in the circles right now. I, my heart goes out to manufacturers who are trying to figure out how to keep up with this, as well as the design firms who are trying to decide what they should be looking for and, and, and how. So, and, if, and, and it, red list confusion is not the only challenge here. Um, Health Info is actually multifaceted and you know, LEAD initially helped start driving in demand for health information with products with the restrictions on VOC content and the VOC certifications that we already talked about. And GreenSpec and Environmental Building News started looking um, beyond VOCs at MSDSs and, and tar targeted contact. Um, Green Format added um, some new, uh, new structure to this, Living Building Challenges. Uh, teams have added uh, added the the red lists um, to their demands. The precautionary uh, Perkins Will precautionary list has different demands. Other firm questionnaires um, have their own chemicals of concern. Pharos is trying to capture it all, and now we have the lead uh, healthcare and lead pilot, and now lead 2012, adding. Um, New, new demands on. So it's getting confusing. User demand for transparency is at an all-time high, but the result is kind of chaotic in terms of 
how to know what you should ask for as a, as a design firm or what you should offer as a manufacturer in information to this. Now, as you heard last month, those of you who were on last month's webinar, um, the LCA, Life Cycle Assessment World, has done some, um, some significant work in the last three years to organize the ask for the kinds of information that LCAs look at with these product category rules that specify what information needs to be collected and how it's reported out um, to the user. And um, the number of organizations and you've talked to already and, and some that you'll hear about in for future webinars are doing a lot to, to get um, environmental product declarations on a broader a range of products. Unfortunately, EPDs don't yet really deal with the health issue. Um, they, uh, LCAs have a very tough time with some of the issues raised by, by human health. Um, but we, we have a, we have a, an increasingly well-defined set of information, um, just know that we need for it, but no standards or format for how it's, uh, how it's communicated. So what we're doing with the health product declaration is a health equivalent to the, to the environmental product declaration, the EPD, that is setting up a standard reporting framework the kind of information on content and emissions and certifications and the references we overlay on that to interpret it um, to make a consistent health product declaration that can make a more, um, a more consistent, repeatable uh, process for, uh, for reporting this information out um, to the users. And we're considering how this goes in master format as well, and how this can work and complement with the EPD, and in fact, um, be plugged into EPDs to give them that missing health component in the future. So the you know the, the promise of a combined health and environmental product declaration um, is very appealing as a one-stop shop for getting the information you need on the health and environmental impact of of a product and what we're after. We're developing um, health product declaration as a standalone first and then we'll plug it into EPDs once, uh, once we've been able to mature it through some, some field testing that I'll describe in a moment. Uh, it's designed to work either in a paper or electronic format, um, so it can be used for communication either directly from the manufacturer to the architect or through, uh, through Pharos or declarer type systems um, with more interpretation. Uh, to the architect. We're seeing this as a way of, of getting the content and health information that, um, that building developers and owners are really starting to demand and that many of, many of us along the chain are concerned about um, consistent through the whole communication chain. We're seeing this as a, a tool for communication from supply chain to manufacturers and reps and from the manufacturers out to um, to the architect and the specifier and to the contractor and, and, and even directly to the owner. And of course, um, for in moving communication between architect and owner, um, between contractor and sub, and, and in final delivery of the project to, uh, to the owner. We think this has um, opportunities for, for smoothing out the communication of this, of this information taking you out of the burden of being the sole interpreter of this and making it something available that's available all the way to the end, to the owner at the end. And of course, um, something that can uh, facilitate um, getting information into interpretive tools like, like Greenspec, Pharos, and Declare, and, and others that are trying to help you understand these issues and, and make selections. Um, we'll, we're looking at how this fits into master format, we'll get more into that later. Um, key to this is that this, this is a tool that's being designed by and for design professionals and, um, and building owners. It's um, not, uh, not, a, not a trade association initiative, though we're in discussion with a lot of manufacturers, but really a, a user, an end user driven um, process. We have a working group with representatives of 30 firms. Um, a steering committee representing um, some of the some of the big firms in this uh, in this space, and um, and a whole range of founding endorsers. Uh, and we 
think say we're engaging now with uh, with manufacturers very actively in a, in a pilot with 30 manufacturers who have um, who have stepped up to test out the uh, the, the draft form um, and just started that process last week and will be running um, running through that for the next two months. I'll talk a little more, more later about how that process um, is working. But first, let me go through is what's actually in um, a health product declaration. It has six basic elements, a, a description of the product, an inventory of contents and health warning, um, a section specifically for testing and certifications, um, section on accessory materials that, uh, that su support the product, areas for notes, and for certification of the declaration. Um, the, the product description area is pretty straightforward. Name and ID of the product, manufacturer name, description, uh, master format numbers, and date of the declaration. Content inventory is really you know, where the rubber hits the road here, the, the heart of the heart of what makes this um, make this makes an important uh, unique move forward. Um, elements of the you know the full disclosure are the substance name, um, the cast number, the which is the chemical abstract uh, system identifier um, that uniquely identifies uh, chemicals and can link it up um, with health warnings percentage of product and, and authoritative listings um, that identify if a chemical has, has been associated with human health endpoint. Um, we also have places for information about uh, recycled content, use of nanotechnology, and the role or function of the uh, product. Then um, manufacturer totals up the amount of the um, of the product that has been fully disclosed, 100% obviously being the ideal, but not something we're necessarily going to reach with all products all times now yet. And then so that's the less level of disclosure of known residuals, residuals being contaminants that might come from the manufacturing process, like a catalyst that remains um, in trace elements in the product or a monomer, or um, contaminants that come all the way from the uh, from the feedstock, like heavy metals that might come along with gypsum and gypsum board, for example. Um, there is a disclosure of of uh, how the screening against uh, chemical hazards was done um, and where the list came from, and then for the. Uh, um, information about the VOC content as well as full list references for where the health warnings come from. What hazards are we looking at? Um, we have a very um, uh, carefully defined list of the authoritative lists from various governmental bodies um, with the, the mandatory list, um, what are, we call our high hazard list, one based on something called the green screen, on benchmark one of the green screen. The green screen is a, uh, a program that's been being developed, um, spearheaded by a group called Clean Production Action, but collaboratively um, working with a number of, um, of both nonprofit and corporate um, entities that are concerned about moving toward inherently safer chemistry. And it... Um, based on, on work with the, in the EPA's design for the environment and then building on that a whole toxicological screening um, procedure for um, assessing chemicals on a, on a four-level benchmark uh, between chemicals of the highest concern and, and those that are inherently most, uh, most safe. Um, the, uh, the green screen, uh, the green screen, the health product declaration um, utilizes the, uh, the authoritative list references in, um, that are part of the, the first benchmark of green screen as those that are mandatory to, um, to disclose in the, uh, on the declaration. Then there is a secondary strongly recommended level of, um, of lists to disclose, which are those identified in the FARO system, which has taken the, uh, the green screen, um, but taken an all listing approach. So, you know, it's, It'll be a good day when we have um, most of the chemistry that we're using uh, thoroughly assessed in the green screen. We're still at a very early stage of that kind of toxicological assessment um, of all chemicals. So pending that, we've developed a, uh, um, another list-based approach that looks at a whole another range of authoritative lists, prioritizes them, and prioritizes the confidence in the science available um, to make 
a uh, another tiered um, tiered level of uh, of concern framework for applying to chemicals and um, and we use that to broaden the number of chemicals we can address. And we make that easy for manufacturers to uh, um, develop these forms with a, a tool in the in the Ferros um, in the uh, in the Ferros online tool. Ferros is a, a building material selection tool um, aimed um, aimed at uh, architects and designers and specifiers to help them understand the um, health impact of. Uh, an environmental impact of the materials, but I'm not going to get into that in depth today except to show you this chemical and material library that's in it, which allows you to look up chemicals by cast num number by name and get a, a, a quick, uh, quick report response on what authoritative governmental hazard lists um, they, that chemical may have appeared on and, and what human health endpoints it um, um, it might trigger, and whether it's a green screen benchmark one or not. Uh, so, in addition to these um, these lists of health hazards, we uh, um, we also strongly recommend um, on the health product declaration to indicate um, whether chemicals trigger either lead credits or um, living building uh, challenge red list. Uh, restrictions and again the uh, Ferro's chemical library uh, can help with that. We'll be um, we'll be modifying this to accommodate the lead 2012 chemicals of concern. Um, once that is complete and validated, and we know exactly what that list of chemicals is. So. Um, this this is all well and good for full disclosed products, but what about uh, those manufacturers who are are either not ready to disclose um, due to their own intellectual property and competitiveness concerns, or not able to fully disclose because they're using a component from another manufacturer um, who is not fully disclosed to them or has them under other than NDA? We anticipate um, this, and though the ideal of the HPD is full disclosure, the HPD is designed to accommodate. Um, manufacturers at the level of disclosure that they are um, ready to um, to engage in at this time and make it an easy apple to apples comparison for the user to understand what's being disclosed and what's not. Um, and so we define rules carefully for what fully disclosed means and what to say if you're not fully disclosing. Um, and the HP requires disclosing health warnings and the functional role of the product, even if you don't disclose the actual ingredient name and cast numbers, so you can at least understand if there is a potential um, health issue involved with even an undisclosed product. Uh, then, of course, there's a whole section on certifications, where the type of certification and emissions or content are recycled. Um, recycled content is indicated um, where the program um, comes from, the certifier certifying to the program, the laboratory where it was done, whether it's a first, second, or third uh, party type certification, dates, expirations, and access to the, to the actual original certificate are all here. In addition to identifying the facilities, that um, that the certification actually applies to, if it uh, if it applies to all of the manufacturing facilities or is specific to um, to certain ones, as the emissions ones sometimes are. You also indicate if it um, if it if a uh, the VFC emissions program uh, is in accordance with California Department of Public Health version 1.1, what we've known as 1350. Um, the accessory materials area provides a way to make connections to those materials that need to go along with an, ex an installation or a use. This might be um, a pre-coat you know, sealer, as in, as in here, with a, a connection to a, uh, to a health product declaration for that product also, or it might be a green cleaning agent recommended by the manufacturer. Anything suggested or required by warranty would be listed here. So all this is well and good. Are you going to trust it? Um, of course. Um, there will be a strong desire on users to see this information certified when, uh, when possible. And the declaration is set up to work either as a self-declared um, as a self-declared certification, that is, uh, you know, manufacturer's self-declared self claim, um, or to be certified by a third party. No, um, 
uh, certifiers yet certified to it. Of course, that makes sense. We haven't actually issued a final um, version of the HPD, but um, several of the, of the uh, large certification programs um, are already interested in the HPD um, and and um, preparing to offer certifications to it as soon as um, as soon as the HPD is finalized, and they can. So we expect to, that these programs will emerge fairly rapidly. Uh, the notes section allows explanation of things that uh, that um, that require more more explanation than the form itself allows, um, and. And to, to facilitate manufacturers actually filling this out, we've developed um, a fillable form that is a protected uh, PDF form that has um, has spaces for fillouts and and some error checking built into it, and is also a little more aesthetic than the version I've been showing you so far. Um, that's just so rolled out last week, and I haven't even had a chance to rework my slides yet. Um, but this is this gives you the look feel of the uh, um, of the new form. And we also, of course, have provided the manufacturers with detailed line-by-line -line instructions for how to fill out the form, what we expect in each section, uh, and how different variations on, on, their, on their product themes might, uh, might be best expressed in it. This, of course, is one of the things we'll be, we'll be testing out as we go through the pilot, making sure that manufacturers understand it and can, um, and can fill it out in, in consistent ways. So even with all of this um, paper support, we expect that we'll get a certain amount of schemes from manufacturers overwhelmed by the um, by what we're asking, and so we're providing them with uh, with lots of support with a, a listserv for all the 30 pilot manufacturers, that their own contact person from our pilot committee, and a series of webinars to discuss issues that come up over the course of um, of the pilot. We're now um, deep into the pilot, not deep into it, we've just started it actually, it just started last week, um, Thursday, with a, with a launch um, webinar for the manufacturers, and they will be um, filling out their, um, their forms, working on that over the next uh, two months with support, as I just described. After that, we'll go into um, a period of reviewing and uh, reviewing and revising the form. Uh, both looking at the feedback we get from manufacturers on the challenges they have in um, in filling out the form, and we'll be um, we'll be working with a large group of, of end users of uh, protection specifiers um, and and developers and owners um, to test out the uh, the form for its actual usefulness and whether we're getting the kind of information that we need and how best to make it. Um, Make it comparable and 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 usable um, for uh, to uh, to facilitate making making buildings with better knowledge of, of content and potential health challenges. Um, at the end of that, we'll um, we'll release a new version um, designed for for public use and. Um, and look forward to this spreading widely through. Um, uh, through the industry and providing everyone with um, with much better better tools for understanding what's in products and and how to move toward inherently safer products both on the specification side and on the manufacturing side and to facilitate that communication. So we encourage you all to to learn more and and get involved. Um, the HPDWorkingGroup.org is the website where um, you can download a sample of the current pilot version that we're using to, uh, to take a closer look and um, see which manufacturers are involved and what firms are involved in the, uh, in the process. And if you want to contact me after, um, after this webinar to um, follow up with more questions and interest and, in, and engagement, um, you'll find a contact, um, contact form at, uh, um, in the, uh, the hpdworkinggroup.org website that will allow you to, uh, um, to communicate with me. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, stop now and leave a lot of time for your questions. I'm sure you, that you are indeed. You're, you're uh, 10 minutes early.
Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, record record time, but I figured I'd leave leave you guys a lot of time for uh, lots of time for discussion. Yep. Oh, no, that's good. Um, I have a general question. Uh, this graph, this whole concept of HPDs and how they're useful to specifiers and architects. Is this a design tool before you select a product, or is this something you would put in the specifications requiring a product to have an HPD with certain qualifications? I think it has, has application um, at at several stages in the in the design process. Um, obviously, there there may be um, application early on if you have. Um, if you're, for example, doing a um, living future uh, project and are trying to meet the red list, or you're trying to meet one of the um, um, one of the uh, lead pilot credits, or once the mm -hmm. 2012 is out, the chemical the concern credit, or you have a um, a particular um, client concern for avoidance of um, you know of uh, of either a particular chemical or substance. Or a you know a whole group and group or class of them, this will help you um, make and in, inform judgments um, on the uh, on the front end uh, to specify materials that avoid the chemicals of concern to whether it's concern to your firm or to your client or to the program um, that they're trying to meet. It also, of course, um, may have um, great utility. Um, as you go on, um, go on through the uh, through the process. I, actually, before I even get off that, I should add that um, in addition to avoidance of particular chemicals of concern, um, LEED 2012 is uh, proposing in the chemicals of concern credit to reward disclosure of um, of content in materials as a uh, as a discrete point, and this will be a very useful way. Of um, of documenting meeting meeting that credit of getting getting disclosure of um, of content and hazard um, as is currently envisioned in that credit design, but then stepping further through the uh, through the process, um, it's something you'll both want to include in um, in the uh, in in the requirements um, for the for the product to be able to document your um, um, to be able to, you know, to document your adherence to any of the programs, or to a to, or to client requests, or just for, um, you know, for uh, the handover to the client for them to um, to have full disclosure on what they've got, um, and thereby be able to for the owner to take on responsibility on that end, um, and also for potentially for the substitution process. This could really help. Um, to have built into the substitution process as uh, particularly when you're trying to maintain um, certain client or programmatic priorities in a project um, to meet um, you know a living feature or lead uh, lead credit requirement or just client um, client desire to have you can you know the HPD can be a way of of making sure your substitution process um, doesn't go awry and uh, and and get you off track on those kinds of requirements. Mm -hmm. Okay, could this be problematic with public bid jobs where you have to keep the um, bidding open? Um, it's going to be uh, you know th there won't be any um, you know any restrictions to what manufacturers can create HPDs. We'll be aiming to make that as easy as possible, um, as you know, as smooth and frictionless a process as, as possible. And uh, I suspect that in addition to what um, you know, what we at the Healthy Building Network will probably do to integrate it into our tools, that other um, that others who um, you know are designing tools for manufacturer um, product assessments and all also will be doing that as well. So whether manufacturers want to do this on their own or 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 you know, it, um, easily done in, in registries, I expect this will um, that um, that it won't be long before um, before these will be pretty readily available and won't be any particular you know reason for a you know for a manufacturer who wants to engage in a public bid not to be able to produce mm -hmm. this. A question slash request from Lauren. Just requesting if Tom, if you could potentially go back to the slides on section five and section six, 
just went a little quick um, so they're having some issues there so just I guess can we just clarify that a little bit more or at least just recap it a little bit more section 5 on declaration certification and section 6 on notes sure you're seeing section 5 the section 5 slide now so to, re to return to this yes question of um, what confidence can you have in this um, declaration is assessed here and there um, there are two things we're doing. Actually, there's been a slight adjustment even since I made the slide um, in that the, 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 the health product declaration accommodates both manufacturer self-declaration of information and third-party certification of all the information in HPD. So a man, in other words, a manufacturer can fill out an HPD um, and, and deliver it to the market um, themselves totally as a self-declaration. It calls not only for, um, for uh, identifying as, you know, as is identified here, the contact of the person who developed the HPD, but in the final version of it, we're asking for a sign-off from a, um, um, from a high-level officer of the company as well. So, you know, it, it gets a, um, so that there is acknowledgement uh, that, um, that the manufacturer is taking this seriously and it's, you know, and it's a high-level um, high declaration. Uh, it's also um, not available yet, but, um, but we expect rapidly once uh, the HPD is completed that, third, that there will be third-party certifications available for that. That is that um, organizations like ULE and SCS um, uh, that we're familiar with from the VOC emissions certifications will also um, step in to provide um, provide services to manufacturers who would like to um, would like to have their HPD independently third party certified, and that would be indicated here. So, more question about that um, that I can that I can address about that process, Matt. Uh, I'm waiting to see if Lauren has anything, but I think okay. we're probably covered that. Um, Great. Oh, she says she's good. Thanks. And 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 there are um, active discussions. I'll just add to that um, with the developers of environmental product declarations, which of course are already a third third party certification of um, um, of some of the content issues and of environmental flow uh, impacts of the product. And see many of them are interested in incorporating this in, which would be another way of getting a third-party certification if this, is, if this declaration was incorporated into an EPD. Um, the notes are just opportunities to, to clarify other items within the HPD. We have a cross-referencing system so that um, any, any particular field in the HPD can have an explanatory note. Um, added to it, providing the manufacturers with an opportunity to further um, explain whether it's, um, you know, an explanation of the facilities that are, that are covered by a VOC mission certification or the, um, the rationale for why they cannot at this time disclose a, uh, um, a particular content um, efforts they're making if it's, uh, if it's because of a a third-party supply chain of where they're going with uh, this college. It's an opportunity for them to discuss different issues that might come up in, um, in the development of the HPD in, in more depth. And there are a wide number of opportunities that, you know, reasons that people may have for wanting to, uh, um, wanting to explain one or more of the items in it. Okay, Matt, are there other questions? In the audience? I have a question here. It's going to take me a second to read it. Feel That's free fine. to bring yeah. anything up you'd like to in the meantime. Yeah, I'll ask this question. Um, Tom, do you think uh, HPDs will go the way of um, certification, third party of certification? Because I don't think the public's going to buy the self the, um, certification. Um, you're saying you think the public won't won't buy self-declared versions of this, and right versus third party. Right. My my expectations is that there will be um, a strong preference for um, for third party certifications. It's interesting. You know, it's an interesting dilemma um, because uh, I think you know third third party certification 
um, is something I think is very important and is you know has served a, uh, you know served important purposes in increasing our confidence in um, in what we know about products and um, and you know and, and assuring more consistency in you know in how standards are applied. Um, there is I you know, I want to mention though that I'm aware there is a um, you know an, an alternate concern that it um, that it provides a challenge for small innovative firms who are um, trying to get new new products out to market and it's easy for a large large company to uh, to absorb the cost of certification um, but a, uh, a a small company may have a harder time with that and I think it's important for us to be um, aware of that as we uh, as we all um, push third party certification to you know to increase our confidence level um, and you know I, th I think there's probably going to be um, I think I think there could be an important role to be played for uh, with things like the small business administration and, and all engaging in, in helping small businesses overcome the um, the hurdles of of the costs of testing and certification because I tend to agree that with the with the with the caller that um, that it's going to be uh, a hard sell for a manufacturer to um, to convince the public of their self declaration with uh, um, you know with the kind of debates and and trust challenges that there have been in recent years. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, um, Matt. Do you have that question? So the question uh, kind of starts to stem into what you were just talking about there a little bit, but it was um, wondering with red lists um, being more of a potentially a hazard-based way of looking at things and the ability mm -hmm. in today's day and age to be able to detect the presence down to a chemical of a few molecules existing, but you know its ability to prove any harm is at minimal at best. Is there a way that HBDs will be able to acknowledge risks, hazards, and exposure? Within the report, that's um, that's a very good question, and and something that, as as noted, is becoming um, is becoming more and more of a challenge uh, as as detection limits go down. The ability to to find find small uh, small bits of uh, of hazardous stuff in an in increasingly large number of, of places. Um, risk assessment is, um, you know, has been um, is an obvious potential answer to that, but has challenges um, has challenges of its own. Uh, it's very subject to the assumptions made by the uh, um, by the risk assessor, and is and, and is very uh, resource intensive and um, and. And not easily applied across the the large number of materials that we need to deal with in making decisions about um, each individual building product project. Um, we're we're looking at that um, in the in the in the Pharos project. Um, we are going to look at the uh, at threshold issues and how to um, how to do something. That will be more um, more rapidly functional across more um, materials, and then going the full risk assessment route would be. Um, there have been a number of interesting um, efforts made in, in other industry industries outside of the building industry, the automotive industry, for example, to um, to establish threshold levels of concern for for chemicals of concern, and we're um, we're reviewing that and. Um, and in you know in the process of determining how best to apply those to um, to what is currently a very um, pure hazard based assessment. So stay, you know, I don't have an easy answer to that. So stay tuned. We're we're very uh, conscious of it, and um, and I expect that I'll have a very different answer or, or more I say more complete um, answer. In you know, in somewhere in the next six to twelve months, um, we're going to be doing work with um, with the University of California in Berkeley, uh, um, addressing both uh, that issue and the related issue of how to project without doing lots of complicated testing. How to project what um, what kind of chemicals are are likely to be residual problems out of um, process chemistry and which ones are not to help focus our resources on only looking at those um, 
looking where there are um, known reasons to believe that there are going to be problems coming through. Yeah, let's, let me ask this one more question before you do that, Tom. Uh, okay. LEAP 2012. Yes. Does that incorporate HPDs? Um, not explicitly in the credit language right now, but mm -hmm. um, uh, but it's clearly. Um, but we're we're actually we're in conversation with um, mm -hmm. you know CBC staff. There we have members of them on the uh, on the working group, um, and we're consciously aligning the HPD with the um, you know with the approaches that staff is considering for that credit. Um, and so this will, you know, we're, um, we're definitely working toward making sure the HPD is ready to support, um, support the LEED 2012 Chemicals of Concern credit and think it'll be, it'll be the, uh, um, uh, the best ways for, um, for preparing your submittals for it will make, it, uh, make that process relatively easy. Um, that's the whole idea of, uh, of the HPD. Um, is not to add a new new layer of, of complexity and chemistry to your uh, to your job that you never thought was supposed to be a, a chemical or toxicologist job, but rather to um, to help you deal with with uh, the rising demands and concerns of of dealing with uh, potential um, toxic content of, of products in a in a consistent um, consistent formatted way that can uh, that can help you. Um, get through, get through dealing with this with these, and um, um, without requiring you to do a lot of research um, and create your own forms um, and, and and inquiries of manufacturers to to help manufacturers um, develop a consistent way of of communicating this information out that interfaces well across a whole range of programs from from LEED 2012 to the Living Future to the whole range of individual concerns that, um, that your clients may be bringing to it. So hopefully rationalizing this whole process and, uh, and making it much more streamlined and easy and making it easier to make apples to apples comparisons and, and, to, uh, um, and substitutions and you know, make that whole process much, much less challenging. Okay, Matt, are there any other questions before? Otherwise, we could um, go off the air a few minutes early. No, it looks like we are going to be able to wrap up just a few minutes early this week. Well, thank you all. I appreciate your attention and uh, encourage you to, uh, to click over to hpdworkinggroup.org and uh, drop, me, um, drop me a line if you're interested in keeping apprised of future developments on the health product declaration, and we'll keep you informed as we get closer to... Uh, uh, roll out this fall. Very good. Thanks, Tom.